Hello and welcome to Meddling with Nature. There is definitely a bird right there in the house. What is yeah, that? That's a little house sparrow. Yeah, it is. Well, you're a big boy. Passer domesticus. Well, I don't... Well, now what? <laughs> uh, uh, well, I guess we're going to have a... To go catch this, should we catch the bird? Or it's, I don't think it's happy. I don't think it's happy at all. Do you want to catch it and pause this? Yeah. That's funny. I didn't catch a bird last night. I've usually done pretty well catching these. Well, you like the router. <laughs> okay, well, there's two of us, so that makes it a little easier. Um, uh, might just try and guide it out the door. You should keep it in a box overnight. I don't think that's nice. Well, they can't fly at night. They'll just be, he won't perch somewhere safe. It'll be like... They might as well just let him fly around the house today. Okay. So this is an impromptu podcast, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Karina, Nate, and Mike are not part of this. This is just me and our special guest, Taylor Tavis, or as I would say, Taylor Tavis and I. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Johnson. And I'm Taylor Tavis. And... I feel like we're distracted. <laughs> and the sparrow over there, we're going to name... Archie. Archie. Welcome to Meddling with Nature, a podcast about life, death, and the process that transforms one to another. We are taxidermists, printmakers, performers, collectors, advocates, and anything we need to be in order to carry out the work we do as naturalists. Each week, Mike Price, Karina Young, Nate Wessel, Jeremy Johnson, and guests will explore topics ranging from ethics to arachnophobia bone cleaning to stuffing tigers. So go on, love, put the kettle on and give us a listen, won't you? All right, well, uh, bird in hand is worth two in the bush, and we just got one in a DeWalt chop saw box until tomorrow morning, in which uh, birdie will be let go. Um, so today this is a little bit different than our normal types of podcasts because it, Mike, Karina, and Nate are not with us, nor Dan, um, who is you haven't heard yet, you will, next time. Editing's taking a little while. Um, so today, I've got a special guest! Uh, and his name is Taylor Tevis. And uh, he used to live with me at the Meddling with Nature house slash studio uh, for well over a year. Um, also, you know, started learning the process of taxidermy, has lugged deer around and all sorts of stuff. So, without further ado, Taylor, Welcome! Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I, like I said, I'm Taylor Tevis. Um, I, uh, I, got, I got my bachelor's degree in biology, um, and while I was working on that, um, I began working at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. Um, it's one of the largest collections of venomous snakes in the world. Um, so I got to work with cobras, you know, um, South American lanceheads, um, gaboon vipers, puff adders. Um, type ends and everything. I mean, all all sorts of the the most venomous snakes in the world were there at the reptile zoo, and I spent a good four years, you know, working with those snakes. Uh, and what we do there is, as keeping that many venomous snakes, it, it was a venom lab. Uh, so what we what they did was extract the venom from the snakes to sell to pharmaceutical companies and things of that sort. Now, why would they do that? Like, what what is it about venom that pharmaceutical companies would be interested in having? Um, I mean, they have pharmacological properties, um, so it's like black mambas. They have a, a protein in their venom that is actually a major anesthetic. Um, and they were trying to, I mean, they, they said that it is probably stronger than morphine, and you don't mm -hmm. have all the addictive qualities. Um, but that's still in the making. Um, but there's tons of stuff, like um, Gila Monster Venom that was used as a diabetic medication. Okay, tell me more about that. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not... The um, the venom is essentially that it's regulatory for the animal because it's an animal that spends a great deal of time sedentary. It doesn't really move a lot and it eats very little. 
Um, and so they, they kind of believe it's, it's kind of a mix of things. So it's a defense mechanism, but it also helps them regulate their metabolism. So that way they can, oh, cause they, they only have like two or three meals a year. And that's, I mean, they need to be able to store that food and keep it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they store all the fat reserves inside their tail. Um, that's why it's so big. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about the base. Yeah. Um, so now currently I'm working at the, uh, the Chiricahua Desert Museum. Um, it's another serpentarium type place. It's a much smaller collection than that of the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. Um, we probably only have about 400 or so animals. Uh, it's mostly um, rattlesnakes, but we do have other other southwestern natives. Now, is that like a, a venom sort of thing too, or is that more of a preserve? Or? No, no, it's not. It's not a, a. We're not a venom research lab. We're just solely um, an exhibit. So I'm an, I'm a keeper there, um, okay. and all I do is I, I maintain the animals or a portion of the animals. I have a small section, um, and and I I take care of about probably 150 snakes. So not Jeez. not very small. Okay, yeah. Now uh, when you lived here, I remember um, how many how many did you have while you were here? Um, I think I had about 30 snakes. Or 30, so. yeah. yeah. All non venomous snakes. I mean, it was it was. I think, when I was here, it was mostly boas and pythons. Mm-hmm. Um, small boas and pythons. Uh, Woma pythons, Sabu pythons, um, Madagascan tree boas, mm-hmm. um, black racers. Um, nothing, nothing crazy. <laughs> um, so, like working working at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, you were working with some pretty uh, some pretty dangerous specimens. I know, like there were a lot of stories of of just well, there's even stories on. Uh, uh, available on uh, on what was the show? Fatal Attractions. Fatal Attractions. Yeah. Fatal Attractions. Yeah. So so I mean, your boss had a lot of you my know. my boss at the time did. I mean, he, he's he's a venom extractor, so he's handling venomous snakes every day, mm-hmm. barehanded. Um, mm-hmm. What, what I, I mean, what I was doing was was you know it was it was all using tools and everything, being as safe as I, I possibly could, you know. But I, I mostly took or um, took care of the cobras. The monocled and Indian cobras, but I mean, it it is safe um, if you do it right every time. It's safe, but I mean, Jim is a testament to that. It's, <laughs> it's I mean, he's been bitten. Now, is that something you wanted to do? Like, like I, I damn it, I want to work with things that can kill me. Um. Well, I mean, it's not it's not even about them. I, I mean, I don't even it doesn't register that they're. High, I mean, I know that they're really dangerous, and I have a great respect for them, but it all comes down to their their behavior like you kind of you, you know what to expect from them um and if you ha- use tools all the time you have very very little chance of ever being bitten mm-hmm. um and you can do it safely and i mean they're not they're not they're defensive i guess they're uh, is is what they are i mean mm-hmm. they're not they're not out to get you they're not they're not like trying to make your day bad they're just they're, <laughs> they're, they're scared you know I mean, I mean, so, and, and some of them are more defensive than others, um, but, but even as captive animals, I mean, they, they can, they can calm down. Well, I think that's something too, just in, in, in human, <clears throat> in, in human societies, like we've always kind of recognized the snake and, and spiders and other things that even to the point in which, uh, phobias of these things are, are pretty, you know, there's some debate as to whether that's even ingrained in our genetic code, um, from, from, uh, you know, pre homo sapien days but uh you know like satan is often um described as a serpent um but then again which is interesting about what you're talking about with uh with the medical extraction lab you know the the, the Kentucky reptile zoo uh you also have a very very um obvious sign of medicine there which is the uh the staff of asclepius yeah. Um, and so I think it's interesting that you've got both the the heal and kill aspects of the the symbol of serpents. Um, what do people mostly mostly ask you when when they you know like well, let's say you're you're sitting at a coffee shop or a place like that and and uh, and somebody comes up and says so what do you do because that happens and <laughs> and then you say what you basically just told me what do most people react to and then what are their questions I mean people are usually like wow that's crazy and have you ever been bitten that's probably the number one question uh-huh. so, have you ever been bitten which I have I've never been bitten by a venomous snake and I hope to keep that <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But but I mean, people are always it's e- it's either it goes both ways. You know, people are either enamored by it, they're like, "Oh, it's so cool," or they're like, "Oh, you're crazy. Get mm-hmm. out of here." <laughs> but they do say that. I mean, they 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 get put off by what you're doing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, and, and I mean, I like to I like to tell people what I do and, mm-hmm. and what I work with because it is. I mean, it's a, a, a lifelong passion of mine. Yeah. Um. But but I don't think I mean I think I think for the most part people people are accepting of it. I mean, all right. There's a there's. Obviously, connections in what we're doing, uh, and you you dealt with a little bit of the taxidermy thing, and and by I guess by proxy, I needed to deal with some of the living snake thing, which I absolutely loved. It's just not yeah. you know I I know more about birds and mammals than I do snakes, and so like having you live here for that amount of time taught me a hell of a lot. But um, but the one of the things that that I'm kind of curious about too, because this this has been a lot about art, a lot about philosophy. <clears throat> the ideas of, of life, death, and the American way, and that sort of thing. Um, but the two of us are kind of doing... We're, we're at working... Op- we're at opposite poles. We're on opposite... Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, so, I mean, I mean, you know, Jeremy. Jeremy deals with death. I mean, every day he's, he's dealing with an animal. I mean, mm-hmm. It's a dead animal. Um, and whereas I, I'm a keeper, so, I, I mean, I, my job is to keep them alive mm-hmm. um, and sometimes it, it crosses over where I have an animal that passes and then it gets repurposed into Jeremy's menagerie <laughs> yes it does <laughs> we've got a we've got a Madagascar and tree boa skinned and salted uh, right next to us right now actually it's a beautiful green face oh it is so lovely and the others are a red face right yeah the man- yeah. mandarin face but they're kind of a reddish brown okay. that's what I keep the mandarin face but the green ones are, are not ne- nearly as common in the US uh huh uh um, Hopefully I'll have Madagascan tree boa babies come June. Woo! Yeah, very excited about that. Um, so let's uh, let's see. Um, a lot of what we've talked about in the, in the previous podcast is about the the nature of men and nature. Um, like it's been my argument that that there is a serious separation between humanity and the nature that surrounds us. Which, you know, like nature with a capital N includes humanity. And there's a lot of, you know, even going back into Greek philosophers, there's, there's a lot of discussion about that sort of, uh, that sort of topic. What, what are, what are your kind of reactions to the way in which people, um, segregate themselves from nature? Well, I mean, so take, take snakes, for example. Like my, I keep snakes. Um, that in and of itself, I mean, it kind of, it segregates you from everyone else because people that know nothing about snakes will also make laws against them, mm-hmm. no matter what. I mean, that's why you see a lot of blanket laws in a lot of the states where you just can't keep anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean, it's a, it's a knowledge, or a lack of knowledge, I guess, on people's part. It's just they don't, they don't know the animals, so they, 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 and they don't know that the, the, the the, the organism at all it's just so completely disconnected but that also runs into the hatred of snakes in general with people um, but I think I think there's a, a great disconnect with with humans and nature I mean I, I was you know as a kid growing up catching garter snakes in my backyard mm-hmm. and I think it's kind of and my dad kind of fostered my love of snakes and it's it's you know it's taken off throughout the years um, and for that for me was great because you know I found what I love to do and and so often people don't understand, like, they don't understand the organisms that live where they are. I mean, you have, you have people that couldn't name a bird in their backyard if they, if mm. they had to, or, or a snake, or, or, or any other sort of mammal. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's wild to me, you know? Yeah, and I think, like, we've also talked a little bit about, about, uh, the nature of, of food, too, um, during these podcasts. And, uh, and, I think one of the things that that separates us the most is is really about how we survive, how we live, like a vegetarian or vegan or or carnivore and that sort of thing. Um, I know we were talking a little bit before this that that you know we, we had ex- almost exactly the same description. Then we used the chicken nugget, <laughs> which which was not by by <laughs> prompting on my part, but. Um, 
Yeah, talk, talk a little bit about about how you view the food aspect of this. How you view um, the 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 nature of carnivores to hunt, especially because you know snakes obviously do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people don't see their food as what it is. I mean, a chicken nugget isn't a chicken. You know, it's it's a nugget, and and people don't understand that that it's a life that they're taking to eat this meal, um, and and they just don't want to. I don't know if they want to, they're in denial of the fact that like they're eating the flesh of another organism um, but I think I think more and more it's just it's less and less of the animal and and more about the nugget <laughs> it's, it's all about the nugget <laughs> <clears throat> um, and when we're looking at uh, behavior I think too because one of the things that 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 I've always kind of said is like um, Humans have found themselves to be extraordinarily adaptable, which has created just a, a huge boom in population over the last several thousand years, uh, to the point in which, you know, it's, it's, it's at this upward scale that some would say is unsustainable. Um, but, you know, so as, as some Greeks would have said in the past, um, the, the goal of humans is to be a type of disinterested observer of nature. To, to realize that they're part of it, but then also to understand its facets, remove themselves from it. And, and a lot of, a lot of scientists now are, are able also, and they were then too, Hippocrates is a great example, of able to remove himself from humans, remove himself from, from the, uh, the, the kind of, um, trappings that you get into with that. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to me to know you you are living not in a metropolitan area, you know, and you've worked in non-metropolitan areas while living in them also. And so you you're kind of going back and forth between this this type of wilderness and in the same way that you know Sir Alfred Russell Wallace was in some ways uh, going on on trips and going on on expeditions and things like that to try and find native stuff. Uh when you're out there, in the same way that Wallace was talking about the birds of paradise, which I don't need to quote, but but basically, you know, he was saying some stuff about God, but and well, the lack there, well, oh, complicated. Never mind. <laughs> when you're in those environments, in you come back here to Cincinnati this week. You were in New Mexico last week. You worked at Red River Gorge through the entire time that I knew you. Do you find a, a, a deeper attraction or a deeper connection with nature while being directly in an uncivilized area? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, even so, I, I've, I've been in Rodeo, New Mexico, for seven months now, and I've done a lot of, of snake hunting there. You know, where I, I go on collection trips and whatnot. And so, I mean, you do kind of you got to get out there and you got to get in the, in the mountains. And I mean, you kind of forget. Briefly, for about uh, briefly, like the society that you come from, it's just like you immerse yourself in it. And when you find a rattlesnake sitting on a rock at the top of a mountain, and there's no one there to share that with you, it's just you and the snake. And it's this very primitive thing, and it's hunting. But I don't, I don't, I don't kill the animals or anything of that sort. I mean, but the goal is to find the animal, mm-hmm. and it's just kind of this. Um, it's just an it's an odd feeling, I guess, to be in. To like have this quarry that you want to go find, and then you've hiked four miles in, and you're on on a on a mountain top, and and then you find this this beautiful little snake sitting on a rock. And it sounds, I mean, it sounds to me like like it's almost like a type of of um I don't know like innocence of sorts. I what am I what am I trying to say? Like, because a lot of people go camping. A lot of people go to nature. They they want to, you know, even some, they, they want to climb Everest. Is there a difference between what you live and what a vacationer lives? Well, I mean, I think I can appreciate what I find. Mm-hmm. Like, for instance, like, I know how hard it is to go find rock rattlesnakes. Like, they're not, they're sparsely distributed they're in in the rocky areas they're in the mountains and i mean people do see them like like vacationers things of that sort but i think what you get there is it's it's just it's like it's like walking or driving past something like you get a glimpse of the area in that moment in that that one one time Mm -hmm. but then if you take something like 
you go to the same place for once a week, you know, spending eight hours there a day. I mean, you get a real feel for for the desert, and I mean, because it is it is high desert where where I go, or in Rodeo, New Mexico, mm-hmm. and I've been there before. I went there last year, but I, I was a vacationer, you know, I was a tourist. Yeah, I was there for about a week, and now I feel like I have a great understanding for the animals that exist in this ecosystem that I never had before. Or just some a knowledge base that I can pull from now. Um, and it's it's a really really nice thing. What do you see as your like in yourself? How do you see yourself as important in nature? Um, I guess I don't contribute that much to to you know, um, Rodeo New Mexico. I'm not Rodeo New Mexico, but just the mountain. Like the mountain takes nothing from me, and I, I give it nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so I guess in in that sense, I I. I I'm just an. I am an observer. Um, You're disinterested, and and by disinterested, uh, they yeah. they really mean that you don't have a direct emotional attachment or an invested interest in what you're observing. That's not not disinterested. Like, oh, I don't really care. It's just something that crawls around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I do appreciate it, and I do, but I just don't. I guess I don't think that that I'm an active member in that ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like. <laughs> you know the kangaroo rat and the rattlesnake are. You know they're they're competing for life. It's almost like uh, like aliens on a flying saucer observing Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a prime directive? <laughs> um, no, not particularly. I mean, it's just I don't I don't know I don't I, I guess it's the snakes. I mean, it's the snakes that inevitably drive me up the mountain to go burn in the sun mm-hmm. for eight hours on end. You know, but. But it's the searching, it's the hunting, and I think that's that's kind of in tune with our hunter gatherer nature. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I may not be hunting for my food, but I'm I'm out there in the woods searching for something, and I think that's that's um that's a commonality among man. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. we want to go discover and and find something. Uh, what kind of like what I guess that the oh that is a good question like what is it that makes you want to go up that mountain and find find the snakes I mean <clears throat> we we know uh, in a lot of ways statistically that, uh, that they're gonna be there and that we acknowledge that they are there and um I mean personally I mean it's it's I just love snakes they're 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 just so remarkable to me and and I mean. Like the rock rattlesnakes, they're absolutely beautiful. I mean, they're they're banded rock rattlesnakes, um, Crotalus lepidus clobberi. Um, so like, and the one in this range in the Palencio Mountains, they're like this um, kind of minty green mm-hmm. with dark black bands and little white fleckling, fleckling, flecking all over. Um, and I just like them a lot. And you, they're not really common. You can't, you can't. I mean, sometimes you can go and say, well, I'm going to go find a rock rattlesnake, and it's happened a few times, but. I struck out a lot more than I than I succeeded. I, I think I, I got really lucky the first time I went up there. I found one first time, first hour. Uh, but I went there about ten consecutive trips. Um, after that, I didn't. I, you know, I struck out. Didn't what, find, once you found one, what did you do? I kept it. Um, <laughs> um, that's my my rock rattlesnake. Because um, in, in New Mexico, you can. You can collect two every year with your hunting permit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have them in a nice big um, display aquarium. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think they're they're just absolutely stunning, and you don't see you don't see them around. And there's not a people a lot of people. There's not a lot of people that work with them. Mm-hmm. So I mean, um, I guess compared to other snakes, but, but so in some ways it's like finding that 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 kind of treasure, you know? Yeah, it's definitely a, a treasure in in the desert, you know? Yeah, and, and this exceedingly barren region i mean you find these little little beautiful snakes that are just fascinating uh, and I, I just the rattlesnakes rattlesnakes are just cool <laughs> <laughs> so kind of kind of going in a, a different direction to like the, the simply the biology like we often talk about the reptilian brain in our own neuroscience and uh that it's a, a very reactive sort of thing i know we've talked in the past just as far as 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 how valid that really is when it comes to actual reptiles and their brains. But I think that, um, well, I've even heard it. Like, a snake is a snake is a snake. You know, better safe than sorry, just kill it. Smash it with a shovel and be done with it because it could possibly hurt you. But how many how many um, 
potentially dangerous snakes to humans are there, let's say, in the state of Kentucky? Well, I mean, Kentucky, I mean, there's probably, I think, a, I think it's around 33 species of snakes that, that live in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and only four of them are actually venomous, mm-hmm. you know, so the, the timber rattlesnake, the cottonmouth, the pygmy rattlesnake, and the copperhead. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are all um, pit vipers, so they have heat-seeking pits um, in their face, uh, which allows them to see in infrared. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are the only, I mean, those are the only dangerous ones in Kentucky, so I mean, that's, you know, not even... It's not ten percent. Now, how does that work? Because we we look at ourselves and, and the the amount of senses that we've got, um, but there's other, there's other even even way deep into before um, we, as a species, were even allowed to crawl up on land. There's a lot of different types of senses, and uh, and when we're looking at at pit vipers and things like that. Talk a little bit more about the seeing and infrared part. Well, so it's, I mean, essentially it's a, it's a pit. It's between their nostril and their eye. Um, so crotalid snakes, so um, rattlesnakes are pit vipers. Um, and they can, they can pick up very minute changes in temperature. Um, so you can, you can blindfold a snake by putting, you know, tape over its eyes. Mm-hmm. And it can still strike a warm target. But this isn't like smell. No, not smell at all. Um, but they do have very, very good sense of smell. Um, and that's when you see tongue flicking and things like that, that um, that nature. So when they're when they're flicking their tongue out, they're actually picking up scent particles and touching it to the roof of their mouth, um, and that, that is, is their their data center. You know, I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's where they're they're figuring out like, is this food? Is this a person? Is this dangerous? You know. Um, so they have, I mean, they're well equipped to hunt their prey, um, and that's what they use it for. You know, seeing in infrared, um, a lot of um, Pit vipers are nocturnal, mm-hmm. so they hunt at night when the temperatures are cooler. Um, and a, a mammalian animal would would glow bright in their eyesight, um, and it, it goes straight. You know, the, the it goes essentially to the optic nerve in the brain. Um, That's so, what I was wanting to know. So they're seeing in infrared. I mean, I mean, they they see it just like they would see out of their eyes, mm-hmm. uh, and and they do it very well. Which is something that really we we could not even replicate on a documentary you know like like this is what <laughs> <laughs> this is what the cobra sees yeah yeah well cobras they don't they don't have infrared pits so they're they're lapids okay, um, okay. so they're very sight oriented <clears throat> so um and a lot of a lot most lapids are diurnal so they spend their day hunting so they a lot of them move a lot um and and they see they pick up um minute details in movement mm-hmm. um like i keep um Coach whips and racers, so it's it's you know essentially the non venomous equivalent to um, like a cobra or a mamba. They're very fast, mm-hmm. very agile, very very sight oriented. So I mean you could, and and less so about smell. You know I mean they'll they'll like I have one black racer that will just attack anything that moves in front of its face because he thinks it's food, mm-hmm. um, and it seems to be more more in tune like w- with that with. In lower light settings, like in, because in, in high light they can see better. So like, oh, that's not a mouse. I'm not gonna bite that. But in, it's kind of when it's kind of dim, um, in the room, they'll they'll be more likely to um, try to attack. Well, the anatomy of this is interesting too, because um, well, I don't know if you could even hazard a guess of how many species of snakes there are on the planet. Oh, I, I wouldn't know offhand. Yeah, but it's, it's a lot. lot. It's a lot. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's in the thousands, definitely. Whereas there's one species of human, yeah, <laughs> which is Homo sapiens, but uh, but the anatomy part of it, I, you know, like like uh, like as I mentioned, there's this uh, this cute little uh, Madagascar and tree boa, and uh, one of the the features, like it's different for me as a taxidermist because I know certain things cause more problems than others. Uh, so when I'm looking at working with constrictors. Well, how do constrictors kill their prey? Well, by constricting, I mean they they have lots of, of tenuous mus- musculature to you know constrict their prey and mm-hmm. kill it. Whereas like a, a rattlesnake wouldn't have that that same musculature. So when you're skinning it, I mean you'll see that you know where where it's a lot harder to skin versus a rattlesnake where the skin just falls off because they just don't have that connective tissue for constricting prey. Because they have venom. They have venom, so all they have to do is bite the prey, let it go, and then they'll find it when it dies. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's <laughs> that's that you know like 
it's unbelievable how different the experience is of of, of skinning, particularly you know, like like a, a rattlesnake versus uh, a boa constrictor, even of the same size. You know, like like yeah. this this Madagascar and tree boa took. Um, I would say probably an hour, about an hour to an hour and a half, whereas a uh, a rattlesnake of the same size or even five times as large, if they existed. <laughs> Uh, would would take about twenty minutes just yeah. because of that connective tissue. Um, of course, it comes with its own little issue, which is the venom glands that you don't want to really puncture yourself with. Because I was bit by this tree boa, I don't know, uh, <laughs> dozens of times. It's like, yeah, that kind of hurts, and just yeah. keep going going with it. But there's another interesting feature that that I really would like to to hear more about, which is the pelvic girdle of snakes. Um, Particularly this this Madagascar and Trebo, I noticed yeah. you know like like the the vestigial legs. Yeah, so they have they have spurs. Uh, the males, I mean, they both have spurs. Males and females have spurs, um, and those are supposed to be or hypothesized to be vestigial structures that were once legs at one point because mm-hmm. it's believed that snakes came from limbed creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, so they evolved legless. They evolved from legs to legless. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it, they just didn't need them, and they they kind of. I, I, I believe it's they were a subterranean lifestyle where they spent a lot of time underground, um, where limbs just kind of got in the way. Kind of um, like how certain species lose their eyes. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, you see even lizards that have done it. Um, mm-hmm. There's legless lizards. Um, they're, they're called glass lizards, but they they've secondarily lost their legs because they no longer became useful. Now with this tree boa, those those um, those spurs were extraordinarily pronounced. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, they're, they what they do is when when they're breeding, the males will when they're they're trying to get the the female in the mood, they'll just like tickle her back with mm-hmm. those. Like you'll see them, they'll be completely erect and then just kind of vibrate them back and forth. Uh, and it, to us, it looks like tickling, but you know, it's it's just <laughs> the uh, the males just trying to get her in the mood. Yeah, um, it's very interesting to watch uh, snake courtship. Hmm. Uh, but but these these types of uh, Vestigial legs, they're not going to be as pronounced in other species. Or non-existent altogether. I mean, or non-existent yeah, altogether. Yeah, and I believe, I believe it's only boids, so boas and pythons. That's kind of been my experience. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's, that's, that's the case, but I'm not entirely sure. <coughs> um, but it's, I mean, the, the, the diversity of snakes, I mean, they go from, you know, reticulated pythons that can be 27 feet long and 200 pounds to, uh, flower pot snake that's only about four inches long and you know a couple millimeters in diameter like, mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely tiny and it's it's it is amazing to, to have that the great diversity you know in mm-hmm. snakes i mean it's just it's amazing um what what else what else would you want to Tell the the listener, <laughs> tell the future listeners about about snake behavior, snake courtship, even, um, or reptiles in general. Like we we consider them a lower class, and in some ways, because they're they're insidious to us, uh, we almost consider them <laughs> in some ways lower to insects because I mean, of the dangerous properties. Yeah, and it's 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 I mean it's it's. Personally, it's unwarranted, mm-hmm. uh, but I mean, there's a there's a long history of people and snakes, and and it's kind of because before there were anti serums and before there were hospitals, I mean, if if you were bitten by a snake or venomous snake, you know, it could be potentially life threatening. You know, you could lose your life or lose a limb even. Um, now, now with the advent of anti serum, I mean, most people who are bitten by venomous snakes don't die. I mean, it's it's very very rare with. When they get medical treatment, they get anti serum. Um, it's typically not life threatening. And uh, not to not to run down a rabbit hole here, but uh, venom is very interesting to me because um, it's not a poison. It's it's uh, it's it's something different altogether. And one of my favorites, tetrodotoxin. That's what uh, what you have in black widows. And that's related or to well, fugu or that rattlesnake. Is- like how describe venom to me. I mean, I mean, venom is a is a it's a protein. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean, it's a lot like you know we produce amylases in our saliva. Um, it is believed that it starts like a salivary gland. Um, you know, like evolutionarily speaking, like it went towards um, 
being useful to to kill prey. Well, help us out with with amylase because what's that? Amylase. What about amylase? Uh, most people have no idea what that is. Oh. <laughs> Um, it's a it's a protein that we produce through our saliv- salivary glands that helps us degrade food before it actually gets ingested. So is this the sort of thing that like when you're uh, when you're in a elementary school and they say let's learn how a cracker turns to sugar, <laughs> that pre digestive process? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pre digestive process that um, you know what some people do. Some people you know they just swallow the food whole. <laughs> <laughs> the rude ones. <laughs> the rude ones. Um, but that's a step ladder. That's a step ladder. So it's it's something that we excrete through our salivary glands that helps start the breakdown process. Yeah, it's pre, of food pre digestion. So when I mean it, it also I mean it kills their prey, which is good. I mean it's like you know they don't have to. It's handling time. Like I mean think of a boa constrictor that has mm-hmm. to literally constrict its prey. It's a very intimate encounter. Whereas. I mean, you know, it has to grab hold of something that could potentially rip it open. I, mm-hmm. mean, I mean, it's dangerous, you yeah. know? Whereas a rattlesnake or cobra, all they have to do is bite it, let go. Mm-hmm. Handling time's over. They they don't they don't risk a lot, you know? Um, so they don't have to just sit there and hold on to the animal while it's fighting, you know, mm-hmm. fighting for its life for good reason. Um, so, I mean, it's become a very, very good tool for, for them. Um, and can, you, can, can, you, can you give me, like, a, a few stepping stones from... From that, um, you mean like from? Well, we've got from digestive we've, from digestive to this magical thing wow. that just beats the shit out of, well, <laughs> out of prey. Well, I mean it's soft tissue, so I mean you don't. There's not a lot of you can't look back at the fossil record and look at venom glands. Sure. So you can't you can you can see venom systems. Yeah. So like the <clears throat> the evolution of the tooth, the injecting system, mm-hmm. the hypodermic, the first hypodermic needle. Yeah. Um. So those have changed a lot. Um, and there, there's different levels. So like, um, so some of them elapids, they're front fanged snakes. They have, you know, fixed front fangs. They can't move or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's bipyrids, which have retractable fangs. Mm-hmm. So they can, when they don't need them, then they, ha- and they can retract them. And when they need to use them, they can, you know, extend them fully and then inject a large amount of, uh, of venom. But they have a deeper penetration. So some like gaboon vipers have like right. the largest fangs. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that's that's kind of the, the the famous poster child for that. Yeah, gaboons and haboos. I mean, they have massively long fangs, but the, but they're able to you know get a lot of venom deep into the the soft body tissues where it's gonna do the most damage. Whereas lapis, they have smaller teeth, so they're not gonna get as far in. Um, and there's like colubrids. They're they're rear fang snakes, so they have fixed rear fangs. Um, and they they don't have the the hypodermic needle essentially, so they have to like chew onto their prey mm-hmm. to get the venom to go down down through like capillary action, just like going like on the outs on the surface of the tooth. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 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 let's let's say then uh, when we're looking at something like a Komodo dragon. Yes. Um, well, they have they varanids are that's they have like a they have a venom gland, but it's not necessarily like they can't inject it. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of lizards actually have this, but a lot of, like have they have a rich bacterial flora in their mouth, which right. aids them in, in taking down prey. Um, but I wouldn't say. I mean, you know, maybe they bite something and then it runs off and then dies from um, septicemia. But it's a, I mean, it's a little different. Still, I mean, technically that's like a type of venom. But um, but is it like yeah? Like when we're we're classifying that, is that more of just because of the bacterial? Uh, interaction is it more poisonous or more venomous? How is it classified? Well, it's still venomous because I'm mean, poison. Poison you have to ingest. Mm-hmm. Um, venom is injected; it gets in your bloodstream. Okay. So I mean, it would tech- it would kind of be a venom, I guess. Uh, but there are lizards that actually have venom apparatuses. So Gila monsters and beaded lizards. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they have a, a venom gland in their lower jaw, and they actually have ducts which lead into their teeth. Um, and their teeth are grooved, so uh-huh. so they can you know when they they chew the channels. Yeah, channels. It's a capillary action up the tooth. Um, so I mean, it's kind of a primitive. I mean, that's how they believe that that they evolved. Like snakes, even with their hypodermic needles, it used to be a grooved tooth, and then it just kind of the, the tooth. Um, so how is it that a slobbering Gila monster doesn't uh, poison itself or venomize itself? Well, because venom isn't poison. 
So they can. That's they, right. <laughs> so you, pass. you can take a, a, a shot full of venom. Uh huh. You know, shot glass full of venom, and and uh, you'd be fine if you know, as long as you didn't have an ulcer. You know, you'd be good. That will blow people's fucking minds. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> oh, first curse word for the entire podcast. <laughs> but I think that that's you know, like like drawing those distinctions between um, yeah, because I think. People use the term venom and poison synonymously. Interch- yeah, it's interchangeable. And, and even in, in in the literature, like, I mean, you know, even as, as early as the 80s, I mean, mm-hmm. poisonous snakes. I mean, that was in all the field guides and stuff. Yeah. Um, because there, there wasn't really a distinction, and, and it was synonymous, you know. And now, more and more, it's becoming, you know... People are very uptight about the, the venomous and poisonous thing. Well, one thing that I've found, like in, in even a lot of field guides, is that it is it is really saying poisonous and venomous snakes. And but I've never seen in any of those field guides. And they're not new. I mean, they're a little older. So was that like something of a of a changeover of opinion? Of, of yeah, I think I think it was just like the definition of what it, what it means to be yeah. venomous. You know, and. And so the two terms were probably at one point used together mm-hmm. in, in maybe different forms, but and then it's just led to just being venomous. Yeah, so it was really the field guide was snakes that'll fuck your shit up. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are some snakes that are poisonous. Oh, okay, go, please. Um, I'm not, I, I believe it's like a keelback, a small keelback snake from Australia. Uh-huh. It, it, it's, a, I think it's, it's an lapid. Um, so it's also venomous, but if it gets eaten by something, it's poisonous. So the field guide really is just a bunch of pretty pictures of this. But it's, a, it's like a, a monarch butterfly is poisonous. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's kind of. A, I mean, it was it was recently discovered, I guess, um, that it was poisonous as well. Mm-hmm. Throwing a wrench into this whole conversation. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Wait, but, but that was one. In, that was one instance where you know a venomous snake could be poisonous. Yeah. Um, but. No, that is that is that is definitely interesting because I mean you know that's something that that usually poisons are are the sorts of things that I think of like poison dart frog, mm-hmm. really good example. Yeah. Um, the monarch butterfly, uh, other things that will cause slight discomfort to an animal if it's if it's eaten. It's like, I will never eat one of those again. Yeah, exactly. The blue jay eating the monarch butterflies. Like, no, well, not doing that nope. again. <laughs> Even though it's so pretty on a calendar. Yeah. <laughs> But 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 the venom thing. I think that that's that's something that is that is so so fascinating to so many people because such a tiny amount can can really kill very large things compared to that amount. Like when we're talking oh, yeah. grams. I mean, and, and um, milligrams. I mean, well, yeah, milligrams. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I'm very small. I mean, there are some very very hot snakes. I mean, mm-hmm. um, inland taipans. Um, and in, in, inland taipans, black mambas, they're all, they're lapids, um, but they have a highly, highly neurotoxic venom. Um, so that essentially shuts down your respiratory system and everything. I mean, it just, everything just shuts down. It's like a very, very, um, venomous, uh, mountain hiker who puts the, you know, the pick into the mountain and then the mountain just explodes. So, <laughs> so how, how is it that something so small can cause such devastation? We know it's a protein. What else about venom rewrites the, the system to shut itself off? Well, I mean, it's you know, it's um, it binds to neurotransmitters, and you like so the the banded crate. So it has this bungara toxin, mm-hmm. and it makes an irreparable binding of of your neurons. You know, like uh, so, your your synapses get clogged with these these proteins or these these molecules, and they can't get unclogged. It's 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 final. <clears throat> your brain has to actually make new connections before you can get better. Hmm. Um, so a lot of people who, who are bitten by banded crates, I mean, they'll they'll be on a ventilator for months mm-hmm. while their brain is like rewiring itself. To come back, you know, and that would be a, a, a very extreme example of a neurotoxin, right? Yeah, I mean, it's one of one of the most neurotoxic. Um, and then there's also a blood toxin, like when we're looking at brown recluse versus black widow. Like yeah, well, blood so, toxin versus nerve toxin. Yeah, so you have tissue damaging um, proteins. A lot, mm-hmm. most of your, a lot of your rattlesnakes do um, have, you know, mostly um, tissue damaging venoms. Um, but there's some crossover there. So, like um, in the Mojave rattlesnake. There's two populations. Um, one has the type A, 
and one is a type B. Hmm. The type B does mostly um, tissue damage. Type A is highly neurotoxic. In um, the same species? In the same species, but they're geographically separated. So, like, in Rodeo, New Mexico, we have the type A neurotoxin, uh-huh. uh, Mojave rattlesnake. And then if you go, like, towards Tucson, um, then you have type B. That, that I'm sure, confuses a lot of people as far as how we classify a species. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they can still interbreed with one another and everything like that. I guess that is the key, isn't it? Um, Whether you create a mule. Well, it's it's well, I mean, they're they're viable offspring. It's not just it's it's just a, a geographic geographical variation. Um, and, but it is interesting that they can they can, you know, evolve independently of one another um, to more effectively mm-hmm. dispatch their prey. Um, and so when we're looking at at Neurotoxins. Okay, so 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 basically, when you get injected, that that goes into your bloodstream. The bloodstream goes into your brain, yeah. obviously, because yeah. most of that blood is going to be shunted up there. Um, <clears throat> from there, it's able to get through the blood-brain barrier because it mimics neurotransmitters. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure, okay. but it, it, I mean it it does get through. You yeah, know? Um, and this is why cocaine gets through yeah, too. I mean, yeah. a lot of shit gets through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. But it's, I mean, it's it's interesting stuff, and there, I mean, there's there's a whole host of of different venoms out there. Like it's not just any one, and a lot of it's a concoction of different types. So mm-hmm. it's not all neurotoxic. It's not all tissue damaging. I mean, it can be a mix, or it can be one or the other, or I um, mean, you just kind of kind of don't know. Um, but but it's. Hmm. It's very, very interesting. So it's interesting too that uh, when we're thinking of, of salivary glands as as being the, well, I guess a different variation of venom glands. Um, but you know, when we're looking at let's say this this little snake on the table, um, which is not venomous at all, still has a type of salivary gland. Well, yeah, I mean, it produces saliva. I mean, sure. that's that's a gland. Um, also, seems to be in relatively the same place. Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a, with, with venomous snakes, um, um, crotalids and, and elapids, I mean, it's on, it's on the top part of the jaw, so, I mean, it's like, it's moved and it's, it's, it's... Behind the eye. Behind the eye, you know, uh, up on the, the top part of the head, kind of, on the side. I mean, so they have one on each, they have duct on each side that goes to each, um, each fang, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um... But I'm not entirely sure where, like, where exactly they're producing all the saliva in, like, a boyd, for for instance. Right. Um, but not they do thinking. when they're eating. They, I mean, they produce more saliva. Yeah. Um, what about the generation time for venom? Like, how long does it take to to create like a lethal dose? To let's say uh, something easy, um, prairie rattlesnake. Well, well, it's, it's venomous from day one. Um, mm. But I mean, I mean, are you talking about like a lethal dose to a human or a lethal dose? Because we all know to humans. a lizard. We all know humans. Well, I mean, it could be it could be a lethal dose as a baby. I mean, you know, prairie rattles. I mean, they're not they're not known for being particularly hot. Um, but you could, I mean, you could have a, a, a not like a copperhead. Those aren't right. People okay, don't consider better, them particularly venomous. That's a better example. Though, um, because, yeah. And there's not there are some deaths attributed, but those are mostly due to anaphylactic shock. Mm-hmm. Um, because your body freaks out because of the foreign protein inside of it, and, and so that your chest causes seizes a chain up. Reaction. And so, I mean, I mean, it's it wouldn't have you know could have not been fatal, but but it was. So it just kind of it depends on the bite. I mean, I mean, depends on the person. Mm-hmm. I mean, some people are are more susceptible to snake bite than others. Um, I mean, and have larger reaction like like um, especially if you work with snakes a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, they believe you can develop anaphylaxis just from handling feces and things of that sort. Hmm. Um, that you can do, okay. Yeah, like it can be aerosolized. Right. Um, and the same with like handling like raw venoms and things like, um, Jim and, and Kristen were always, they had, they had to wear respirators and stuff when they were handling the venoms because they were worried about that inhaling the venom and then developing, um, anaphylaxis if they're ever bitten. And Jim, Jim was on a TV show. Um, fatal attractions, right? Yes. And so he's bitten. He's been bitten a number of times. Yeah, I mean he's he's had his his share of, of snake bite, but he he 
what he does, I mean, he handles the snakes. Like, right. like he grabs them behind the head, extracts the venom, and he does that in large lots. I mean, hundreds of snakes in a day, and he does that every day. Yeah, think of the, of the week. percentage on that, and it's amazing. Yeah, you know? uh, and I mean, I mean, he does have for what he does, he has a good track or surprisingly good track record. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's also stories of, of people that are doing similar things as as Jim at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, um, but have worked themselves into being inoculated of sorts. Um, what are those? What's that about? There's people that they, they think they develop immunities to to snake venom, mm-hmm. um, and and they're kind of crazy. I mean, <laughs> That's kind of what I was hoping you would say. Because I, when we're I, looking at like neurotransmit, I, uh, especially neurotoxins, Jesus, how do you? How I do mean, you? I mean, I mean, they do it like <laughs> they do with horses. You know, they inject themselves with small amounts of venom, and they increase in size. But most of the people that do that are pretty pretty loopy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would, I'd never even thought of considering doing that myself because it's just, it's not worth the risk in itself. You could give yourself an anaphylactic reaction just by injecting yourself with small doses. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just they're interesting. <laughs> I feel like I've been saying that. But it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, self immunizers are, are you know. They're just not. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, this is this is a recording that is actually going out in like an hour. Um, we're not really editing this, uh, which is why why you know eh, no, actually, I think this has been very successful. Um, we don't have many breaks in conversation or anything else like that. Which are uh, a lot of our other podcasts. We are talking for two, three, four hours. Um, so this is this is kind of a fun experiment for for us to see what we can do in the time allotted without making any major edits. Um, so if you listen to this as soon as it's posted, then you will be listening to it pretty much real close to live, <laughs> depending on your time zone. Almost live. Almost live. <laughs> um, so Taylor, there, thank you very much for for being able to to uh, come on to the Meddling with Nature podcast and talk about your expertise in. Herpetology? Is it with an uh-huh. H, or do we just want to say herp? Herp. Like Wyatt Herpetology. Herp. Herpetology. That's fine. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to say to uh, to anyone that may listen now or eventually? Learn your snakes. Learn your native snakes. That's right, Dad. Learn all of them. And then you go out into the field, and you see a snake, and you can say, well, that's a black rat snake. Just because you read a book. Impress your friends. Impress your friends mm-hmm. with all your snake knowledge. Impress yourself. Impress yourself. <laughs> all right, well, this is uh, Jeremy Johnson and Taylor Tevis signing off. Uh, we appreciate your business. If you need anything dead stuff, let me know. Um, we also do dissections and workshops, uh, insects, base work. Not like sound base work, obviously. I haven't gotten that down yet, but woodworking. You need cabinets? We can do that www.meddlingwithnature.com That's www.meddlingwithnature.com Say bye! Bye! Woo!